From Content360, this is the state of client acquisition. Welcome to the state of client acquisition. This is your host, Michael Bohannes. Today, I want to talk to you about something that most people consider a strength, but I think that it is a weakness, and that is relying on your network to get you clients. When you are a coach, consultant, or small B2B company, then network is very often seen as a crucial asset. The more people you know, the more you will be able to get into the relevant conversations with prospective clients, and the easier it will be to get clients. Now, in the beginning, that is, of course, true, but the stronger your network is, the longer you are sheltered from the fierce winds that is the free market. And the longer you stay in this sheltered space, the longer it will take you to develop the skills that will help you survive, because inevitably you will have to go there into the free market. So that is what I'm going to be exploring today. And without further ado, let's get right into this week's episode. It's funny how a few stories that seemingly don't have anything to do with each other suddenly start to make sense and coalesce into a interesting narrative when you take the right lessons from them. So today I want to talk about how two separate instances in my life have taught me the lesson that a network and being embedded in social structures can actually prevent you from growing. So the first story is I was about 16 or 17 and I just wasn't happy with the allowance that my parents gave me as one should not be and so i decided to make some money for myself for the first time in my life and in if you're listening to this in the us you would say well obviously you would do that in austria that's a relatively rare occurrence it doesn't happen all that often that a 16 7 year old would get a summer job but i just simply wanted to make a little bit of money on the side and I just didn't know how to do it because because it is so rare. So there was really nobody to ask. And of course, there was no internet at the time. That's how I, how old I am. That where to start. And so I asked around in my, I told my parents, of course, and then I asked around with a few friends. And then what happened is that in the town where a family friend of ours worked as a doctor in the hospital, there was a gardening store, a gardening and landscaping store where he just happened to know someone and he spoke to him and he was willing to take a look at me. So I went there, I met the owner and he and I, we got on quite nicely and he offered me the job for the summer that I would essentially be a helping hand in the store, helping them with, you know, the planting, the, you know, carrying around a couple of sacks here and there and helping them with the landscaping business. And the money he offered me was okay. I didn't think much of it. I was thinking, that sounds all right. Uh, it wasn't great, but of course, as a 16-year-old, what can you expect? So I said yes. And the work actually turned out to be pretty brutal. It was also, as I said, a landscaping business, which means that they were redoing people's gardens, which means it's not only about carrying small little flower pots from A to B, it also means that you have to roll around giant wheelbarrows of liquid concrete from A to B. <laughs> and so I remember there was one moment where I almost tipped over a wheelbarrow full with liquid uh, concrete. It would have been a total mess if that had happened. And I also had to get up at 5 a.m. to be there at 6.30 a.m. when the work started. And I also remember that the guys were constantly smoking in the car when we were on the trips to the client. So it was not a fun experience. But then I thought the money is OK and so I'll, I'll be happy to live with it. So fast forward a couple of years and that family friend, I don't know anymore what the occasion was. He told me that he had actually subsidized that job. He did it as a favor uh, to me, to my family. And he wanted me to feel good about myself when I was doing this kind of relatively hard labor. And he was subsidizing it to the tune of about 2x, I believe. I think if I remember correctly, I was making roughly 1000 euros a month uh, in the currency of the time. And he was subsidizing half of that. So the owner was actually only willing to pay me 500 euros. And so my friend there, the family friend, subsidized it with another 500 euros. And I know that he meant well, but I did feel deceived by it, that I had not actually added so much value as I thought I had. And it also felt a little bit icky that this person, you know, the grown up has intervened on my behalf. And 
Also, I think one of the mistakes that he made here was that he did not teach me a lesson. I think the lesson is that when you go out into the market, you just, you know, better accept what is there and just work your way up. Money has its value. And if somebody is only willing to pay you 500 euros a month, well, that means something. That means that you should better look for something where you can make more and strive to develop yourself so that you have higher value in the market. Because if you don't, you're going to be stuck with those 500 euro a month jobs going forward. And so I think it would have been a good lesson in humility for me, knowing that not only was the job pretty crap, but I was actually making much less than I thought I was making. And the third lesson for me here was that, and that's kind of the main lesson for this podcast, is that it shows how your network skews your perception of reality. And especially if we view this in the light of the second story that I wanted to share with you, which is when I started my business in 2016, I had a pretty strong network in London. So I had been for many years immersed in the London startup community. I had been working at Google for three and a half years and I had an MBA from one of the top schools in the world. So my network was pretty strong then. And sure enough, it has given me a reasonable amount of revenue, not much. I think it was some four or $5,000 a month on average that I was making via my network. But the problem was that I was doing all kinds of random jobs. Yes, on paper, I had a content marketing agency. So the main work that I was doing was writing blog posts and white papers for companies, but also I was supplementing it with whatever came around. So there was, for example, one gig that one of my best friends simply handed to me. He was working at that company and they were downsizing and they just had a workshop where they could probably use someone with my consulting background and sort of very highly structured analytical thinking that I could help them think through that. And that was a project that had nothing to do with my expertise. It was just, sure, I'm, 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 I'm reasonably smart. I'm analytical. I'm very structured. So I can do it. I'm good at it, but I would not have gotten that kind of gig on the free market. It was really only through the connection that I had with my friend. So I kept getting those kinds of gigs. And at some point, they started to dry up. About two years into my business, they started drying up as they would. And now in retrospect, I realized that this thing has kept me from evolving. It was two years of stagnation that I was secluded in my little world, in my little bubble of, oh yeah, my network is handing me all those jobs, feeling good about it, feeling, oh, I invested in this and I I made good choices in my life that my network is so strong that I don't have to do anything for acquisition. Gigs just come my way. But that's the wrong way of thinking about it. I was really stagnating at the time and my network was enabling me. It's kind of similar, it's a weaker version of the following, namely that when you have like a kid of a millionaire or even a billionaire, they don't have to do anything. Sure, they probably engage in some kind of commercial activity, but they don't have to. And so their entire world is this strange mixture of privilege and lack of pressure on them where they don't have to perform. They never experience any significant failure that gets them on their toes and, oh, damn, I have to perform here or else I lose my job. There are no stakes in this kind of life. And similarly, I mean, I did not grow up as a kid of millionaires. My parents are doctors, but sort of upper middle class doctors. Nobody, they didn't have their private practice. They were working in a hospital. So we were well off reasonably, but we were not rich by any stretch of the imagination. And we had a nice little network, you know, they knew people, but it wasn't also amazing. So in a small way, I kind of experienced this shelteredness, secludedness of a well-off kid where I never had to kind of struggle for much. I was also good in school, so that came in handy. And similarly, when I left employment, when I was fired in 2016, there was no real pressure to get clients because good stuff would come my way. And the pressure only mounted after I started running out of options two years later. And that's where I started to really become interested in the topic of proactive client acquisition, which has led me now to build a business where I make multiple five digits in my business and helping people to find clients on LinkedIn, because this is a, turns out to be a really rare skill. And when you are in this sheltered environment, you simply are protected from the 
fierce winds of the free market. Imagine if you would get just plonked down on earth, you'd have zero connections, nobody knows you. You would be exposed to what the market really wants and needs. You would be in a place of pure supply and demand. Do you have something to offer to the marketplace that people are willing to pay enough for so that you earn a living? That's a really interesting proposition to me. And I think the goal of every business owner should be to get to that place really, really quickly so that you can test yourself. Do you have what it takes to survive in the marketplace? I find this now a really exciting proposition, even to the point of where I'm always a little bit disappointed, you can always almost say, where I'm a little bit disappointed where an old contact of mine, like right now I'm speaking to an old contact of mine who potentially is going to be working with me. And I don't feel all that good about it because he's somebody who I knew, who I'm kind of, I'm capitalizing on my past relationships. I prefer to actually survive in the raw fierceness of the market out there. So my main message to you is if you, in your business, if you're a coach, consultant, and you mainly live off your network and referrals, you are stifling your growth. Because only when I went through this relatively uncomfortable phase between 2018 and 2019, where it was really hard to get clients, it was very hard to get anyone to talk to me because I simply did not have a refined value proposition that would have strangers to accept my services. And after I went through this very uncomfortable stage, I feel way more confident now, way more comfortable. And I just know that I will never have to be in an employed position again because I know how to create a value proposition now and to sell it to complete strangers. My sales cycle is now one or two weeks long between somebody meeting me for the first time and signing up. And that is such a blessing. And I wish I had had done that. I wish I had done that many years ago. It would have massively accelerated my growth and I would be where I will be from now two years from now, I will be here already. So that's my recommendation to you. Think about, are you relying on your network for too long? And of course, it's okay to rely on your network initially. It would be foolish not to. When you're starting out, your best bet is to reach out to all the people that you know, is to inform them of what you do, tell them what you could do for them potentially, and then just let the chips fall where they may. They will reach out to you if they need you and then go out there and find clients on your own. So you absolutely should leverage your network in this way as you are starting out. But it should not be even remotely part of your overall growth strategy, neither network nor referrals. It's a wonderful little side dish that you can get. And if it comes around, that's great, but it should not be your main ingredient. So if this is interesting, if you want to learn how to get strangers to become clients, just schedule a call with me. You can find me on LinkedIn, Michael Bohannes, or just go to michaelbohannes.com slash apply to see if we could be a fit of working together. Because this process that I've gone through of going away from your network, still accepting potential offers from it, but not relying on it anymore, and instead putting yourself in a position so that the winds whipping in the fierce marketplace out there cannot harm you so that you can survive that and thrive in this environment. This is the process that I have gone through. And this is the process that I teach now. And you can massively accelerate your learning if we were to work together to work on this. So think about whether your network is not keeping you from growing and evolving. And if you think it may be, then maybe it would be a good opportunity to get in touch. Okay. And if not, I hope this was useful and I wish you all the best and we'll talk to you next week. The State of Client Acquisition is a Content360 production. Music by Gavin Knox Grand. To sign up for alerts and to submit written and audio questions, go to stateofclientacquisition.com. I'll talk to you in the next episode. Caffeine burns, wide awake, dreams and colors.